In this edition, Simon Cox asks why the Department for Work and Pensions has struggled to create an IT system that can deliver universal credit. When Ian Duncan Smith became Work and Pensions Secretary, he had a dream to totally transform welfare. At its heart, the aim to combine six different benefits into one, the universal credit. Two years into the project, he denies it's turning into another government IT debacle. No, no, this is not an IT disaster. Uh, this will be delivered in time and in budget. I am not and will not be spending a penny more than we originally planned. But is his big idea about to come crashing down? Its national rollout due this month has been drastically scaled back and in recent weeks there have been several highly damning reports highlighting a lack of financial controls, more bosses on the project than Chelsea football team and a failure by the Department for Work and Pensions to get a grip. I think this is a right old mess and I'm not convinced that the department, the government as a whole, have really got a handle on it. In the report this week, we hear from insiders about what went wrong within the Universal Credit Programme and the culture that developed, whereby staff became paranoid about discussing any bad news. He didn't ring me from a mobile phone. He thought he was being watched from the phone box as he was telling me about the lack of progress on the Universal Credit project. So are these inevitable teething problems, or is it fundamentally flawed? I don't think that ministers really believe that it will be delivered in 2017. I don't think they're lying. Maybe it's self-delusion. Tony Collins, the former executive editor of Computer Weekly, has closely monitored the development of the benefit over the past two years. They've got very few people claimants on the system so far. They'd have to have thousands going live every month to meet the 2017 deadline. I don't think that deadline is conceivable. I don't think it's achievable. They'll certainly need to get a move on. The government claims the introduction of universal credit, along with other welfare changes, will save £26 billion in the next decade. But obviously that'll only be the case if it hits its deadline of 2017. Whenever he's asked about this, Ian Duncan Smith has the same refrain. The plan is, and has always been, to deliver this within the four-year schedule to 2017. At the time I came here, I believed that to be the case. I am standing here today telling this House, whether you like it or not, I am saying that that is exactly what the plan is today. We will deliver this in time and in budget. Universal Credit is a massive IT project, one of the most complex ever attempted by a government department. Although, of course, they're not doing the work themselves, they've employed the IT contractors Accenture and IBM to carry out the bulk of the work. One former senior DWP insider told me when it began in 2011, everyone wanted to be involved in such an ambitious scheme. It hoped to avoid joining the litany of previous government IT disasters by adopting a new way of building computer systems. Someone with knowledge of these systems is software engineer Daniel Tenner. There's a very well-known by now methodology of uh, software development called Agile Development. He's worked on other big projects for Accenture and now runs his own startup. The Agile Development he's talking about is different to previous government IT projects where they'd spend years building one big complicated system that will be turned on and then inevitably fail. Agile breaks up these big projects into much smaller pieces. You try to keep always the system in a state that could be deployed tomorrow and be used tomorrow and would already be better than the current system tomorrow. So with Agile, you might develop a replacement for Job Seekers Allowance first, roll this out nationally, and once it's fully working, then start to add on other benefits like tax credits. But Universal Credit didn't do this. It developed multiple projects for different benefits, which it planned to launch all at the same time. Daniel Tenner says if Agile is done properly, it can avoid the huge sums normally wasted on big technology projects. If you follow something like Agile development, uh, one of its ideas is that it reduces waste, and so you shouldn't be throwing that much software away. What you shouldn't be finding yourself in is a situation where you've built a load of software, like spent six months or a year or six years building a project, and actually all of it is currently not useful and basically generating zero value. But this is what they did. 
The IT contractors spent 2011 working on software, but by Christmas the project was way behind schedule. Worried about the IT company's performance, Ian Duncan Smith ordered an investigation by the consultants PwC into whether money had been spent that shouldn't have been. As you'll hear later, it would be well over a year before this PwC report surfaced. The project had been running for less than a year when Tony Collins, former executive editor at Computer Weekly, became aware of significant difficulties. By early 2012, I had a phone call from somebody who was uh, very close to the project. He was telling me that, that the work that had been done so far may have to be scrapped with a write-off of, uh, of many millions of pounds. Um, the person who rang me, this, this will show you the degree of paranoia on the project about uh, leaking information, he rang me from a, a phone box and was concerned that he was being watched. I suppose it's an indication of how contradictory the information was that the Department uh, for Work and Pensions was absolutely adamant that things were going well. I've been on the phone to former senior insiders within the project. They're too worried to speak publicly. Indeed, they won't even let us revoice their words because they think it could identify them. And they talk about this culture where bad news was suppressed. One said that by April 2012, he knew Universal Credit needed radical change. There were endless debates within the department. They'd become bogged down with minute and often irrelevant details. Another former senior figure said that the top leaders weren't liked because of their style and their inability to grasp the difficulties of the project. Now, what I've been told highlights the trouble that the project was in and chimes with what Robert Devereux, the permanent secretary at the DWP, effectively the CEO of the department, explained to the Commons Public Accounts Committee last month how a mindset had taken hold to put off the big problems and that they remained unresolved. The big decision point for me was at the point at which we got to the review that we commissioned internally, the Secretary of State commissioned himself, that was run in July 2012, which essentially put down the marker that actually the cumulative set of things that are now unresolved are too great simply to carry on and push through with the let's knock another week through okay. approach. So in August 2012, a new chief was brought in to run the project, but three months into the job he died. And this was followed by another senior director stepping down. By the beginning of this year, the project was in disarray. So this time, the Cabinet Office stepped in. The Coalition had set up the Major Projects Authority, which you've probably not heard of, but it has an important role overseeing and reporting on all big government programmes. But in February, this changed. The head of the MPA effectively took over Universal Credit. It was a seismic move, according to one man who saw this from the inside. Emran Meehan was a senior civil servant within the Cabinet Office. Now outside as director of the think tank, the Social Market Foundation, he's free to talk about the significance of this unprecedented action. My understanding is this is the first time that the Cabinet Office went so far as to parachute in the head of the Major Projects Authority. Certainly it's the first time that that's been done and to take over the running of the project and Cabinet Office couldn't have made this judgement on its own. They needed to build a consensus, bringing in the Treasury, bringing in ultimately the political authority of Number 10 to get Universal Credit back on track. After a few months in charge, the Major Projects Authority handed the reins back to the DWP and a new boss, Howard Shipley, the fifth person to run Universal Credit in just two years. As one MP told me, if anyone can save Universal Credit, it's Howard Shipley. He began yet another review, the 19th to have taken place. In September, in his first statement in an article in the Daily Telegraph, he admitted publicly that the project had faced multiple problems. It's also clear to me there were examples of poor project management in the past, a lack of transparency where the focus was too much on what was going well and not enough on what wasn't, and with suppliers not managed as they should have been. There's no doubt there have been mishaps along the way, but we put that right. We'll continue with our safe and responsible approach. It was an early warning shot. Several days later, there was the first detailed insight into Universal Credit when the National Audit Office delivered a searing indictment of the first two years of the programme. It talked about a good news culture where it was taboo to openly discuss risks or challenge decisions. It also identified a lack of transparency inadequate financial controls and the lack of a detailed plan. 
As if this wasn't bad enough, the report from PwC finally surfaced, 18 months after Ian Duncan Smith had commissioned it. It hasn't been published, but was sent to the chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, Margaret Hodge, who says it's one of the most damning reports that she's ever seen. What comes out of the PwC report was the total lack of control over that expenditure. So, first of all, the IT companies were being paid on a material and time basis. So the material they used, the time they spent. That's very open-ended and it means most of the risk rise with the department. Very little of the risk lies with the IT companies. They can just charge whatever they think. That's a bad way of having a contract. But if you have a contract designed in that way, it's key that you monitor it properly. But the department that's setting up one of the most complex IT systems for 8 million households was so overwhelmed it couldn't even properly check its own invoices. They had six people who had to check 1,500 individual timesheets in three days. And no response meant that the payment was made. Now, that is an unrealistic control. They had personal assistance authorising large purchase orders. Again, a PA is not the person with appropriate skills to do the proper controls. And contracts over 25,000 ought to have had ministerial approval. And on a sample of 25 contracts that PwC looked at, only 11 had been put to ministers for their approval. So these were three examples, among many others, of lack of control in expenditure on a contract which is entirely driven by the interests of the IT companies rather than the interests of us, the taxpayer, and the department. The Department for Work and Pensions says changes have been made to ensure this doesn't happen again, and they're pressing ahead with extending the Pathfinder pilot areas. But just how useful are they? The Cabinet Office and its major projects authority conducted its own review of the Pathfinder programme. The MPA's boss, Norma Wood, was asked about this in the Commons Public Accounts Committee. Have you described the Pathfinder as having been so substantially descaped and compromised that it is not fit for purpose? Mm. Um, I think at the time that we did the review that was our conclusion. When she told us that the IT system in the pilot areas could not deliver on the change of circumstances that people have. If you think there are 1.9 million change of circumstances every month, if you've got to do those manually, that's a heck of a task. This IT system should deliver that. It couldn't deliver on the important policy that the government has embarked on, that you have to show that you're trying to get into work before you're entitled to benefit. So if you had a couple in a household and the couple split up, it couldn't deliver on assessing their eligibility for benefits separately. And it had no security, very, very open to fraud. Those key four aspects of the project were not incorporated into the IT system that was piloted in the pilot areas. We wanted to put some of the criticisms that have been made about universal credit to a minister from the Department for Work and Pensions, but no one was available. A spokesman told us the DWP had made advances since the review by the major projects authority and brought in two of the country's leading project management experts. It says there's now a progressive rollout of universal credit in six new job centres in England, Scotland and Wales, in areas including Bath, Rugby and Shotton. But Charles Law from the Civil Service PCS Union says they've analysed the new areas and just how representative they are. We have concerns that they're in locations such as Harrogate, for example, which is, you know, not one of the more difficult parts of the country, shall we say, where there isn't a large unemployed population. It doesn't have the, some of the social problems that you would get in some of the the bigger cities. So we think they could have selected areas of the country that were perhaps more reflective of the broader client base that Universal Credit will have. The system being piloted in these six new job centres won't be like the online bank account that Universal Credit is supposed to be. The almost two million changes of circumstance that take place each month, like Brian in Ashton under line getting a new job, will still need to be done like this. Welcome to Universal Credit. If you need help completing a claim online, press 1.
for anything else if you're calling for yourself. That's right, over the phone, manually, by civil servants, not by the claimants themselves online. But even now, the DWP still refuses to accept that this setup clearly isn't what they'd planned. In a bizarre exchange at the Public Accounts Committee last month, the DWP's permanent secretary, Robert Devereux, refused to accept the system wasn't an online one. No, they're not manual because actually th th things have got to happen in the system. If somebody rings up and says they've got to change of address, processes have got to be run. There is, there is, no, 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 I'm afraid. It can't do it online, it's got to be manual. Well, oh, no, I'm afraid that's not the difference because actually the, diff the, the, the point I'm trying to make is actually my agents are sitting there not with quill pens and paper writing down change of addresses and doing something. They're actually going through in a, in, in, you know, with, with software in front of them the things that they need to say, to do, the processes, all the rest of it. The difference you're, you're is it's not, happening just be clear. it's not happening automatically. Either, either somebody can put in, I can put in, I've changed my address. Or I can't. At the moment I can't, right? You can't, you can't do it online. Yeah, thank you. So how much has this partially functioning system actually cost? The DWP has spent £300 million so far on software for the pilots that only deal with people receiving job seekers allowance. There are questions over whether this software can be used for the more complicated claimants receiving multiple benefits. Margaret Hodge says the evidence she's heard at the Public Accounts Committee inquiry into universal credit has convinced her a big chunk of the money spent so far has been wasted. Over £300 million has been spent with IT suppliers, particularly Accenture and IBM. It looks to me as if most of that money will be wasted. And we still have the final figure to come out. £200 million was suggested at my committee. I think it'll be higher than that. Just think about that. Just think about that money and what it could have been used for. That is what is so scandalous about that particular issue. We wasted and we still have the final figure to come out. Two hundred million was suggested at my committee. I think it'll be higher than that. Just think about that. Just think about that money and what it could have been used for. That is what is so scandalous about that particular issue. So who is responsible? Two hundred million pounds has gone to two firms, Accenture and IBM. Neither would be interviewed and referred inquiries to the DWP. Daniel Tenner runs his own software company, Grantree, but spent years at Accenture working on other large projects. In the big contractor's defence, if you're working in Accenture, you're a partner in Accenture, and you're told that, OK, there's this bid coming in for a billion pound project, and you say, actually, we're going to go back to them and say that their project idea is, is wrong from the start, well, you're not going to stay a partner at Accenture very long. So you're going to have to play that game and try and do the best given the circumstances where the client often specified the project in a way that made it very hard to deliver. So if they won't take responsibility, who will? One obvious contender is the architect of the whole project, Ian Duncan Smith. It's his flagship policy, which he's repeatedly told MPs in the Commons he takes a great personal interest in. For what it's worth, I take absolute, direct and close interest in every single part of the IT development. I hold meetings every single week, uh, uh, full meetings two weeks, and every weekend a full summary of the IT developments and everything to do with policy work is in my box and I am reading it. So I take absolutely full responsibility. I think the Minister should have been more on top of the detail. This is such an important political project. You were a Minister in that department. Do you have some sympathy for Ian Duncan Smith and his ministers for... You know, it's a, a very difficult department having to deal with a lot of changes and this change at the same time. That's an interesting question and I think the honest answer is no. One of the questions I have on the Secretary of State who's been quick to uh, distance himself from the shambles we've got is actually he tried to go too fast on this. Originally there was supposed to be an October 2013 national rollout of all new claims and even today as we speak there is no clear strategy and plan that has been signed off in the department by Treasury by government as a whole against which the department will be expected to deliver an outcome no plan the Department for Work and Pensions continues to insist the project is on time and on budget 
But universal credit is only dealing with the simplest of claimants. By next April, less than 1% of people on benefits will be signed up, and it's already cost £300 million. One former senior insider told us morale within the project was extremely low and that staff were waiting for it to implode. Emran Meehan, who until recently was working in the Cabinet Office, says there are those within government who believe that given its current state, the best course would be to scrap it. I've heard the view expressed that the best thing to do might just be to stop, but it's a minority view. For the most part, what people have been trying to do is to try and make the project work, and people have found that there is scope to make improvements to how you get there. I think there's still a big unanswered question about whether, as you try and fix one thing after another thing, can you keep it on the timetable that it's currently on. But the effort from everybody involved in it in government has been about trying to land the existing programme rather than about trying to stop it and start something different in its place. A lot's riding on the new man in charge of the project, Howard Shipley. He's been conducting yet another review, which should give us a clearer picture of how much of the software developed so far can be used beyond the handful of pilot areas, and crucially, how much it's cost taxpayers. He has provided these figures to the Public Accounts Committee for their inquiry into universal credit, but these haven't been made public yet. The committee's chairman, Margaret Hodge, believes it is salvageable, but it needs a lot of things to be put right. I think... If they give themselves time, if they really sort out a clear business strategy and a clear, what one would call a business plan, if they are realistic and open about their costs, if they're realistic about their timetable, if they stop switching people, this project has had five senior responsible officers in 18 months, some for terribly sad reasons, but nevertheless a completely absurd way of running a major government project. If all those things are in place, then there's a chance, but that's a lot of ifs and buts, isn't it? IT experts say universal credit will happen, but it could be another decade before it's fully functioning. That's six years too late. And they predict it'll cost a lot more than the two and a half billion pounds the government has set aside. Ian Duncan Smith has staked his political credibility on the project being delivered on budget by 2017. But by then, he may no longer be a minister, let alone in charge of universal credit. Mm -hmm.